friends. I'm so excited to welcome you all to February's Science Night offered by the National Mag Lab in partnership with the Leon County Public Library. We are just so excited to virtually host um, Mag Lab for these events. Um, they're one of my most favorite parts of the month. My name is Miss Stephanie. I am a librarian at the main library downtown. I have with me some scientists from the National Mag Lab in Tallahassee who will be teaching you about the science of atoms and physics. And I know you're just as excited as I am. And I'm going to hand it off to um, Yulia, a Mag Lab scientist, to um, continue our introductions for the evening. But welcome, everyone. Sounds great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you so much for having us. Um, we're excited to be here with you all. And uh, I'd like to introduce the, the crew. So there's Miss Stephanie, who you already met. And then we have Mr. Carlos, who's our awesome chat master. So uh, you can interact with us and, um, of course, mainly our guest today through the chat box. So um, try and find the chat box and type your questions, um, thoughts, and whatnot into the chat box. And then Mr. Carlos will pull them out and read them out loud, and we can, um, we can get some answers for you. Um, our special guest today is Dr. Ryan. Uh, Dr. Ryan is a researcher at the Mag Lab. Um, Mag Lab, as the name already says, um, has the word magnet in it. So we are super excited about magnets. We do all kinds of things with magnets. We built them, we research materials for them, we research materials with them. And I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about especially the materials today. So we're really excited to have you all and to share some of our research and our enthusiasm for science. Um, and without any uh, further ado, I'll pass on to Dr. Ryan. Okay, thank you, Yulia. And also uh, thank you to Stephanie and Carlos. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm so glad that um, everyone uh, who's out in the audience was able to come today too. Uh, it's really great. Um, and what I want to talk about tonight, um, and I'm interested to hear uh, what you all have to say about it too, um, is materials, right? So here at the Mag Lab, uh, like Yulia mentioned, we're interested in using high magnetic fields to study materials. But of course, if we're going to study anything, we have to have materials or systems that we're interested in in the first place. Um, and so you probably realize that you know the world around us is made of all sorts of different things. Um, some of them are naturally occurring, uh, like wood uh, or rocks or whatever. Um, but something that makes our modern society really different uh, from earlier times in history is that we have all sorts of made materials. And that means that scientists like me um, are constantly on the hunt uh, for new materials uh, with unusual and um, different properties than what you would find in just stuff that's laying around. Okay, so we're interested in, in new materials. We're interested in knowing how to make new materials. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, and as I go through this, um, I would really like it uh, if people would chime in with questions that they have. I'm going to pose a few questions to you as well. Um, but you know, I'm very interested also just to answer any sorts of questions that you might have about materials, what they're for, how we make them, what are atoms, how do you put them together, uh, anything of that sort. And really answer, or ask anything that you want. So, so Ryan, are you telling us it's anything goes? Why not? <laughs> I'll get through some of my material, but really why not? I mean, I have some interesting things, but we can talk about whatever people are interested in. All right, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, it's anything goes <laughs> question round with Ryan, Dr. Ryan Bob back. <laughs> We've got time. All right, so here we go. Um, let me just ask a question now that I want everyone to just think about, and you can um, write into the chat. I'm just interested to know what type of science you all are interested in in the first place. So maybe I'll, I'll pause here for a minute uh, and see if if you all want to write in anything, um, I think you can probably guess that one of the things that I'm interested in are crystals, but we'll get to that. Do we have something, Carlos? 
Not yet, but I do want to just remind you. Oh yeah, wow. Okay, it's coming in. They are they are okay. typing. I, I was gonna I was there gonna start go. with me first, but they already started. We've got one for physics. We got a biologist. We've got a okay. space scientist. Um, and I'll tell you what, I am I am also a space scientist. I I was hoping to be an astronaut when I was younger. Um, we've got an engineer, right? And so we've got a, a fair mix of um of different topics coming in. I wonder okay, if you have any fantastic. mathematicians. Okay, okay. So I just wanted to say that when I was a kid, I was not especially interested in science. I was interested in a lot of different things, but not especially science. But I think it's awesome uh, for those of you who are interested in science now and sort of have something in mind, but also for the kids out there who are not especially interested in science at this point. Um, I think, you know, the future is wide open and who knows what may come. Um, I do remember at one point when I was a kid hunting for mushrooms in the backyard and I thought that was pretty cool, but that was about the extent of my science uh, when I was in middle school, I'd say. Okay, so it's great to hear that lots of kids are interested in science and the type of science that I wanna sort of focus on, although we can go in other directions too, is to ask you um, what even is a crystal? Right? I mean, a lot of things in the world are crystalline, and I'm going to talk about that, but I want to see what everyone thinks a crystal is. So I'll give you a minute to, to type in some responses on that. All right. I figured if I start talking again, they'll, they'll <laughs> uh, send in answers. And of course, they, they are. Here they come. Here we go. So ready? Number one, a mixture of minerals or rocks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, a shiny thing. Yes. Yes. All right. That's what we've got so far. Um, I would like to say a repeating pattern of material. That's very, very precise. All and right. Uh, we've got a <laughs> All mineral. Of these answers are correct so far. Shiny yeah. things found in caves. And then you're going to love this one a lattice of atoms. Beautiful. It is indeed a lattice of atoms. But even I want to say a few things. Oh, about right. I'm sorry. I got I got one more just came okay. in. Atoms and ions smush together. And that's a very scientific term, too. I like that too. All right. So what is a crystal? It in some sense, it's all of those answers. None of those were wrong. Um, and let me just move to the side. And you can see in my background a nice example of some crystals um, that we grew in my lab here. And you can see, sure enough, they're shiny. Um, they have a nice shape, and what that reveals to us is something really fundamental, um, and this has to do with the answer that was more or less atoms or objects that are lined up in a repeating pattern, right? So when atoms um, are set down in a repeating pattern, uh, this is reflected not just at that atomic scale, but on the macroscopic scale that we interact with. So yes, crystals are repeating lattices of atoms or molecules or even other things, um, but they're also beautiful shiny objects. And that's a reflection of sort of their fundamental property, like the fundamental order uh, that is present in them. And um, I'll just go on to say that they're really important uh, for our day-to-day -day life. Uh, they're in all sorts of technology that we use, and we'll be coming back around to that uh, in a few slides. Okay, so now we've done a little bit of introductions. Um, let me just tell you a little bit more about myself. So I'm a research faculty here at the Mag Lab. I'm also an associate research professor. Um, I have four kids, three girls and one boy, two big dogs, one cat, one fish. Maybe you don't care about this stuff. Um, and just one fact about myself, I love playing Zelda. Uh, Breath of the Wild. I don't know if there's any fans out there, but that's like my favorite. And with respect to science, what I love are crystals. And I have loved crystals for a long time. <laughs> and the reason that I do is that not only are they shiny and pretty and have this, um, you know, incredible property that atoms are lined up in this perfectly ordered way, it's also an environment where you can get electrons to do new things. So electrons are a fundamental particle that I think we've all heard about. We'll talk some more about them. And they're responsible for so many of our technologies, right? Even just transmission of electricity. We need electrons to do that, okay? And then in, in the general 
realm of science, the other thing I love doing uh, is mentoring students. So education is one of my very favorite things. All right, so now a few more questions for you. Um, and I want you to just think about this. And if you want, uh, write in some answers too. Um, who do you think does science? And what does a scientist look like? <clears throat> and any answer is fine. Okay, here we go. First of all, to go back one slight moment, you have at sure. least one other Zelda fan who was very excited that you play. Um, and two others who hadn't heard of it, so we might have introduced some new fans, I'm hoping. Oh boy. Well, it's um, like my favorite game <laughs> by And far. I will confess to you, I own it and I haven't played it yet, so don't oh, get mad at me. <laughs> I, I've been, I have been absorbed in the world of Animal Crossing, but um, okay, I got answers. Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, anyone can do science if they experiment. I've got somebody telling us a scientist is someone with a white coat and experiment goggles. Mm -hmm. um, I got two more people saying everyone can be science. Uh, yeah, everyone yeah. can do science. Anyone can be a scientist. Yeah. Um, scratch that. Five different people telling me anyone that does science. Oh, and one that says scientists look cool. So congratulations, okay. Ryan, on being <laughs> okay. cool. So great. Excellent. So I think, I think that basically we got all of the right answers here, and that's basically what I was going for. Um, I, I want everyone, even if you didn't write in and you didn't have those same answers, um, to realize that really science, it really is for anyone who's interested, right? There's no one type of scientist. And I'll just go back to this statement that I always tell people that when I was younger, I really didn't know that I wanted to be in science. And in fact, I made it all the way to university in the second year of my university, still not knowing that I wanted to be in science. But I did need a summer job, and I found a position in a physics lab uh, that paid. <laughs> so I took that position, and it completely changed my life. Um, so I just want to show you, these are some people that work in my lab. And you see there's all sorts of different folks uh, that, that do experimental research. Right now, I'm going to let Yulia jump in. She's got to say Absolutely. something. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, hey, say, same for me, Ryan. Uh, yeah. When I started university, I had no idea, well, a bit of an idea that I was interested in science, but I actually wanted to be a journalist, and I thought yeah. I'd be a science communicator, a science journalist, but then yeah. I got a summer job in the lab and, you know, got hooked on doing an experiment. So, yeah, similar That's, story there. It's funny how that happens. I thought I would probably be in politics or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for you, Ryan. Thank you. I, I appreciate your vote. It didn't really turn out that way. So it has a way of capturing your imagination, I think. Um, and a lot, I, I guess one other thing that's worth saying is that a lot of people that I know in science who really go with it as a career, it turns out that it's something that they get interested in. And then it's it's so engaging that they kind of feel like they have to do it. So it's that type of a career, uh, if it's the right career for you. Anyways, the main point is that science is for everyone. We, we want everyone. Okay. All right. So let's, let's go back to the science. And I have... Um, Two questions. I don't remember if these were poll questions. I guess they probably were. And they are, do you know what atoms are? And do you know what electrons are? And I guess this was a yes, no question. The answers are already coming in. Nice. Um, but guess right. what? You all can put it in the polls. Now that we've started the poll, they, oh, look, here they come. Four of seven. I wonder if we can get 100% participation. We never get 100% participation. <laughs> but we've got five, six. We need one, one more. more. One more. Come on. Uh, but I'll tell you what, some people started typing. So as we wait for that one more, um, we've got that atoms are the main building block of the universe. Yes. Um, uh, are atoms related to chemistry? Um, atoms are little yes. things that make everything. Electrons are things that jump from atom to atom. I like that answer. I like that. I like that. Um, electrons are the negative charges in an atom. Listen to that. Very good. Um, and and this is this is the perfect time for me to show everyone my shirt. And I don't know if they can read it because <laughs> it's all bit it's all um, small. But it says um, never trust an atom because they make up everything. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> 
And my mom got me this shirt, so. I like it. <laughs> I wish I had that shirt. <laughs> so I think that's, that's, a, that's a good start um, for atoms and electrons. And the reason that I want to ask this question is that um, atoms and electrons are more or less in charge of almost everything we do, maybe everything we do. I guess you could get philosophical about that, but they're oh. really important. So oh. Ryan, we, we, we got a clarification question. Um, sure. When you were talking about atoms, I think, you, I think you said something along the lines of they're the main building block. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody wants to know what you meant by that. Sure, okay, so I, I am going to get to that. Um, let me go to the next slide and I think it'll start to become clearer, but if it's not clear at the end of it, stop me and I'll try it again. Okay, so let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Oh, okay. Let me skip around a little bit. <laughs> it's your, it's your presentation. Good. Feel free to yeah. jump around as much as you want. Maybe it's okay. Let me, let me jump around a little bit. Let's talk about atoms first and then we'll jump back to that previous slide. Okay, so the question is, what did I mean by atoms are building blocks? Well, let's let's first think about what atoms are, uh, in, you know, in the first place. And here's a here's a picture that probably people have seen um, that sort of illustrates what makes up an atom. You have a thing in the middle called a nucleus, which is actually really heavy, uh, relatively speaking. It's made up of protons and neutrons, and then going around it. Here it's shown as like sort of planets orbiting a sun or something, but actually it's more like in, in reality, it's more like a wave that's surrounding it. But there you have the electrons, okay? And the electrons and the nucleus have different jobs, okay? So there's different parts of an atom and they have different jobs to do. So the first part is the nucleus. Oh, I was gonna ask a question. Okay, so, but I'll just tell you the answer. So for the nucleus, this is where most of the mass of the atom is located. And the job that it does is that it basically gives weight or inertia uh, to an atom. It's the thing that, um, you know, if once you get something moving, you have a hard time stopping. Okay, so that's one part. What about the electron? What is the job of the electron? Does anyone know what the job of the electron is? All right, everyone. What is the job of the electrons? First answer in, it can attach to atoms. Indeed, that's true. Let's see if we get a couple more to come in. What is the job of the electron? And by the way, inertia is a wonderful science word. Yes, indeed. It's up there with my favorite science words, along with flux and entropy. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right, one more. Electrons, oh, two more. Um, okay. Electrons give atoms a negative charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can yeah. keep, the elect, uh, keep the atom negative. Um, oh, and here's a new one. It can make the elements radioactive. That's true too. That wasn't what I was going for, but that is true. So let me let me tell you what the electron's main jobs are. Okay, so there's one that we heard about, and that is that it has the electrical charge, right? This is this is what's responsible for electricity flowing, you know, through the wall from the power plant to your house. Um, this is what's responsible for turning on the lights um, and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, this is what most people think about when they think of an electron or electricity. But the electron has one other job as well. And this is a really important job. It actually carries something called spin. So an electron has charge. It also has spin. So what is spin? This is a very strange concept. Um, and in order to get at it, I want to tell you about something called angular momentum. So has anyone ever taken a bicycle wheel um, and held onto the spokes and started spinning it? Right? Does anyone know what happens when you do that? I love that one. We can also talk about gyroscopes or sure. um, from my experience, I've seen motorcycle races where the rider fell off, but the bike kept going. That's right. Okay, so it's okay if you have any responses or if not. And what I'll tell you about this situation is that if you get a bicycle wheel spinning, um, and you should try this if you haven't tried it yet, take it off of your bike at home. Um, don't pay any attention to what your parents have to say about this. Spin that wheel and then try to turn it. It turns out that if you try to turn that wheel, it resists you. It's hard to turn it. And so there's another quantity besides the wheel spinning. It's as though there's another quantity that points 
a, across the wheel, right? And what that is, is the angular momentum that you've put into the wheel by starting to get it turning. Okay, so this is also what keeps a bicycle standing up when you ride it. Um, like Carlos mentioned, it's what keeps a motorcycle standing up even when the rider falls off, right? So angular momentum is something that's really important in our daily lives. It turns out that an electron, even though it's this incredibly tiny thing, also has spin or angular momentum. And because it's on such a small scale, it's kind of a special type. And instead of being something like it's hard to turn a wheel, it has another quantity, which we call spin. And this is basically the thing that gives magnetism, okay? So the electron is responsible for the electrical charge. It's also responsible for the magnetism that we see in some materials. And we really need both of those things, right? So the electrical charge is for lights, batteries, heaters, toasters, semiconductors, insulators. And the spin is for permanent magnets, like your refrigerator magnet, motors, speakers, debit cards, hard drives, and so on. So these are our pieces. These are our little pieces that we can deal with when we think about atoms, okay? And each atom can be a little bit different, uh, which is what we're gonna go on to now. So I, I don't know if I've quite answered the question from earlier yet, but let me keep going and I'll try. Okay, so here we are, here we are. It turns out that when you talk about an atom, it can have different um, numbers of electrons that are hanging around it. The nucleus can be different sizes. And what this does is it produces all of the different elements that we know about that are in the periodic table. Okay, and here's our periodic table. I think maybe people have seen it. Um, I don't think we need to take a deep dive on all these different elements. Just to say that when you look at the periodic table, there's sort of these different categories um, that the elements go into. Like all the way on the left-hand side, there's ones that are really reactive. They have electrons that want to get paired with something. And so if you uh, put those in water, they explode. Okay. If you move a little bit more to the right, there's the ones called the transition metals. These are things like copper or silver and gold and other things as well, platinum. If you go a little bit further to the right, there's all the semiconductors that we know about, like silicon. We can talk more about that. If you go all the way to the right, you have gases, right? Like helium. Everyone likes helium. We all know about helium. Um, but there's other ones too. And then there's this strip down on the bottom that are even different and that are called rare earths and actinides. And actinides are scary. They're radioactive. And by the way, since someone brought this up, they said that electrons are responsible for radiation. It's kind of true. But in those actinides, what's really happening is let's look back at this nucleus. If this nucleus gets too big, it's like you know a bunch of neutrons and protons stuck together. At some point, it gets so big that it just starts to fall apart. And that's what a radioactive thing is. Uh, Ryan, when you put up the uh, periodic table, we had somebody, somebody must be in chemistry or taking chemistry classes now because they wrote um, nightmares of chemistry in a good way. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So this even, I have to say that when I was in high school, even this perspective on the periodic table, I didn't have. Um, this is only something I've gotten later on. Anyways, that's okay. So now, now we've talked about the rules of the game. Remember, we have mass, we have spin, and we have electrical charge. These things can all be sort of changed depending on what element we're talking about. And so let's have a look at how it actually changes. So within the periodic table, for one thing, mass increases as you go down. You know, going deeper and deeper into the periodic table means that the nucleus gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so that's one thing. If we wanna have heavy elements, we go deep into the periodic table. Um, but what about charge and spin? Okay, charge, I've got these red circles. Turns out that if you're kind of on the left-hand side, there's plenty of electrons to move around. So you get like more metal sort of behavior. And then on the right-hand side, um, there's not so much of that free charge uh, ready to move around. So again, we can sort of choose a different color uh, for the type of atom that's there, right? We could have um, something that's very metallic or something that's not very metallic. 
And we could change the rule of, is it very light or is it very heavy? All right, I got a good question for you. All right. Um, first of all, I typed into the box, um, what's your favorite element? And uh, the landslide winner is uranium, just FYI. Uranium, that's um, one of my favorites too. <laughs> I have no idea your name was so popular. Um, but the question is this, if the elements are heavy because the mass increases, is that why the number labels are bigger? Yeah, 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 that's basically right. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's basically right. Um, the, the number labels refer to uh, basically the size uh, of the atom that's there. Um, so good, very good point, very good point. Okay, so now what about spin? That's our last thing. And, and you know, you might think that, well, they all have electrons, they should all have spin too. It turns out that the spin is a very strange quantity and we don't really have uh, the time to get into it um, for why it behaves in such a strange way. But it turns out that if you wanna find spin or good magnetism in these types of elements, it's more or less clustered at the top of the transition metal um, elements down in the rare earths. And by the way, you've probably maybe not really heard of rare earths, but I can guarantee that if you're holding an iPad or an iPhone, that you've got some in your hands right now. Um, and by the way, they're not exactly all that rare either, uh, but they're extremely important because they carry magnetism. It's a good source of magnetism. And then the actinides as well uh, can be pretty magnetic. So, so now you know the rules of the game, okay? You've got um, basically mass, charge and spin. And if you want to make things out of electrons, which is basically what we're doing when we make anything that we use, um, <clears throat> you know, you have to think about which part of the periodic table is the right part. And here I wanna make an analogy. So how many, how many people here like to uh, cook or bake? I'll just, I'll just take a moment. I didn't write a poll question for this, but just curious to know. Me too. <laughs> yeah, you've got a bunch of me's coming in. So we've All got right. lots of chefs here. Yulia, you too? I love to cook and bake and eat. Me I, too. I, I'm, I'm on board for the eating. I don't bake or cook, but I grill. That counts, right? Oh, I like that. that yeah. Definitely. I like that. I'm I do a, have I'm a lot of chefs in the baby. chat box. <laughs> okay, um, so I want to make an analogy. You know, Ryan, 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 before you go into analogy, um, yep. one question came in, and the question is, what are those unnatural elements? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, good question. Okay, those unnatural elements. Okay, let's go back. I just want, I want to show this picture of the nucleus again. It turns out that there are um, a bunch of elements, the ones that we have in our periodic table, um, that nature can just put together. It can you know, take uh, neutrons and protons and electrons and they, they go together. It takes different circumstances, like some elements are only created when a star explodes and, and all of this. But there's sort of these configurations that are stable, that, that the universe just makes on its own. Okay, but we know that the, nucle the nucleus is just a bunch of stuff. And if we wanted, remember, to go to larger and larger nucleus, we go to larger and larger numbers. But you could ask yourself, what would happen if I took one of these guys at the bottom of the periodic table, that's already a big number, and then I smashed it together with another big number element? Well, I mean, if we started at uh, 71, uh, the one on the right-hand side of the rare earths, and we smashed it together with another 71, you'd end up with a 142. And there's no 142 on the periodic table. But that's what people do. They take heavy elements. Um, they, they take them to what's called um, accelerators. And they smash them together. And when they do that, it creates artificial elements that don't occur in nature. And they're incredibly short-lived. Um, they may live for you know, a fraction of a millisecond. Um, but it's a real element, and it has real properties, but it's an unnatural uh, element. There's a whole field of science that's devoted to this. Um, yeah. Oh, I can't hear you, Carlos. 
you're right. I did it. I did the mute thing. Um, okay. <laughs> So I was going to say we could spend the whole night on the periodic table because the next question is periodic table based again. Absolutely. And they want to know, are the elements hydrogen and helium not in any groups? Uh, that's a very good question. Hydrogen and helium are really special elements. Um, the reason that they're so special, I mean, maybe it's kind of goes without saying, but they're the simplest. They're absolutely the simplest. So hydrogen has one electron. And helium has two electrons. And one thing that's funny about electrons um, is that they fill, you, you remember the orbits that I showed you? They fill up those orbits in a special way. So the first orbit, you can put one electron in and then another electron. And then you have to go to another orbit. And then you can sort of fill up on the next row down you know, in a different way. And, and it gets more and more complicated as you go. But hydrogen and helium are the only ones that are right at the beginning where you have one electron and then two electrons. That being said, they do have something, some things in common with the elements that are beneath them. So for example, helium um, has two electrons. That means that its outermost electron shell is full. And that's exactly the same as the other elements that are beneath it. So there's other gases here that don't react with anything because their electron shell is full, and they're called the noble gases. Uh, helium just happens to be the lightest of them. Hydrogen is a bit like this too. Um, so but there's an exception to this, and I wish I didn't have the handle with care over it now. But if you look below hydrogen, uh, what you'll see is lithium. Lithium is a solid. It's a solid metal. And everything beneath it as well is a solid metal. So the only one in this column that's a gas is hydrogen. But besides that, it's very similar. It's very reactive uh, with things. You can light hydrogen on fire. Um, and everything else in that column, you can light on fire too. Because it has that one unpaired electron. And that thing wants to get with something to cancel it out. And so that drives chemical reactions. I think that's a partial answer to that question yeah that's good but they keep coming in so okay you for your next Far one away. let's go <laughs> all right here we go um are there an infinite number of unnatural elements uh yeah i think i think the answer to that would have to be yes i think that you could well infinite so this gets into a question of what you believe could happen so i i guess i would not probably probably say infinite, because that would imply that you could just make any arbitrarily large number of a nucleus. I think, yeah, and let me answer it this way. So remember, I said that in order to make these unnatural elements, you have to smash atoms together. In order to smash atoms together, you have to use energy, okay? And um, one of the most fundamental laws of nature is that energy is conserved. We don't create new energy. We have all the energy that there's ever going to be has been here since the very beginning of the universe. And so that means there's a certain amount of energy in the whole universe. And so if you think that you need more and more energy to create larger and larger nucleus atoms, then at some point, there's a large enough amount of energy that you need to make the gigantic nucleus that would be greater than the entire amount of energy in the universe. So there's not an infinite number of options, but there's probably a very large number of options. <laughs> so, so theoretically, um, if you had unlimited resources and unlimited energy, then it would be infinite, but we don't have that. So therefore it's not. That's right. That's okay. what I would say. I like that. Next question. Yeah. If unnatural elements don't last very long, how do we study and how do we know what abilities they have? Mm, that's a very good question. So that's a, that's a whole other area of science. But what I want to tell you about that is that when, when you make um, one of these unnatural elements, it's short-lived and it falls apart. But when it falls apart, it doesn't just turn into two different nucleus or nuclei it also emits some energy. And it may emit energy in the form of a photon, like light. Um, it may emit energy in the form of a high energy electron, like some electron may go zinging out you know, uh, at high speeds. 
And, and those, um, those are the fingerprints of what it was. So there's a lot of math that goes into <clears throat> figuring out the energy of those being together and then the energy of them being apart. And by looking at those two states and then figuring out the amount of energy that they gave off when they fell apart, you can learn about um, what it was. So not only do you have to do the math, you know, and the computer simulation of what it was together and apart and what it let go, but you also need to have an experiment that can measure that um, high energy electron or photon. And something that's really neat is that some of the earliest examples of this um, are something called cloud chambers, where basically they would get a vapor of, um, you, you can look this up online if I'm remembering the name right, They're called cloud chambers. You can, you can get a vapor of like um, cooled uh, methanol or something like that and set a radioactive uh, element on top of it. And then you'll see paths through the vapor of those high energy particles going through. So the earliest examples that proved that that's a real thing was with people being able to actually see it. Um, now it's much more sophisticated, uh, but I, I think that's incredible. Yeah, actually, I think there's an actual um, at-home cloud chamber activity that you can do that we don't it have is. on our website, but it's there something is. that's it's possible. Um, so, so I've got somebody, and I'm going to try and read this as they typed it. They go, wait, how does it emit a photon? <laughs> Yeah, so this comes back to the idea that energy is conserved. Um, and this, this, this does sort of start to get us into quantum mechanics. Um, how, how to put this uh, in, in the terms that we can deal with right now. So let me, let me try and put it this way. When you have a, um, and let's not talk about radioactive decay yet. We'll just talk about atoms, period. So when you have electrons that are around a nucleus, they have to be in these different orbits, okay? So the, remember, you know, if I fill up um, on hydrogen to helium, I'm filling up that first orbit. And then if I start to put in more electrons, I have to start filling up another orbit. And there's a difference in energy between that lowest orbit and the next orbit. And I don't think we know why that's true. Uh, it's part of quantum mechanics. Um, and there's a famous quote that says, if you start to believe that you understand quantum mechanics, it's, it's proof that you don't understand it at all or something like that. It's kind of a joke. But anyways, electrons are in these quantized orbitals, but there is an energy difference between them. So um, that energy difference, if I'm going to raise an electron out of the inner one to the outer one, and then let it fall back down, the way that nature deals with that energy difference is it emits a photon. Um, that's a very strange concept, but it is where photons come from, or one way to get photons. And a similar process is in play when you talk about nuclear decay. You basically have quantized energy, and when things break apart, the system basically needs to balance itself by emitting energy often in the form of a photon. So, and if you want to know more, <laughs> you need to take quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I love the fact that we've gone into quantum mechanics at this point, <laughs> um, because somebody asked, what if you reverse electrons? So I'm going to try to answer this because okay. I think I remember this. And, and Ryan, you please correct me. Um, the antimatter version of an electron is a positron. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. Um, neutrons stay neutrons. Mm -hmm. And antimatter protons are negatrons. OK. I didn't remember that one, but that sounds right. <laughs> it sounds right. OK. And, and I think I remember that because it's just one letter away from megatron. So I love it. <laughs> that's got to be right. It has to be. Okay, so let me, let me, I, I may, it, there probably are more questions, but let me go on to one more thing that I want to tell you. Well, let me make the analogy. And the first analogy is that, remember, we've said that there's these different sort of um, attributes or characteristics that you can get out of elements in the periodic table. This is a lot like cooking, 
right? Where if you want to make a nice um, cake, you're going to use certain types of ingredients. And if you want to make a nice barbecue, you're going to use other sorts of ingredients. So people that want to make materials that do th things need to be thinking this way. You know, which part of the periodic table is going to get you the behavior that you want? Okay, so I've told you about the Legos or the, the ingredients or the rules of the game. There's one more thing that's really important, and that is that it really matters how you're going to put the atoms together, okay? So, and this is where we need to get into the conversation about crystals. So we know, for example, that Legos can have all these different sorts of colors, but of course the way that you put them together uh, makes all the difference in the world. And it's the same thing for, um, for materials in our day-to-day -day lives. So I wanna give you a good example uh, that Carlos told me. And that is um, the example of what happens when you have sodium. So sodium, by the way, you can't see it here, but it's one of these elements on the left-hand side. So it, you know, if you had a piece of sodium and you threw it in the water, it would explode. Okay, so sodium's dangerous. And then chlorine, chlorine's on the right-hand side. If you were to breathe chlorine gas, it would poison you. So two really bad things. Um, does anyone know what happens when you put sodium and chlorine together, where it appears in our daily lives? All right, somebody typed this into the box because I know somebody knows this answer. Sodium and chlorine mixed together, and we've got at least one answer. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it. I want to see how many more we can get. Okay. Okay, we've got three answers in so far. Uh, let, I'll, get, I'll get one more, and then we can... I'll let you give them the answer. Um, okay, three, we got three answers. Okay, so the answer is if you take sodium and chlorine and put them together, you wind up with table salt. Sodium chloride is table salt. So you have two things that are really dangerous. And then when they get together, they're really important for life, right? So the way that you put atoms together uh, makes a huge difference. It, it's fundamentally important. And that's where we get to the concept of the crystal structure, right? So like we talked about earlier, uh, the atoms are the building blocks. We put them together in some order. And when atoms to go together in a repeating pattern, like shown here, or like in this model, I don't know if you can see this, my background seems to be eh, kind of getting it there. Anyways, you put atoms together in a repeating pattern, that's when you get a crystalline material. And every crystalline material, um, first of all, imposes its own sort of characteristics um, on a material. And then the type of atoms and the flavor that you put in with mass, charge, or spin determines everything that there is to know uh, about a material, okay? So the, this is really what we're talking about um, <clears throat> when we're talking about making things uh, out of atoms. Um, there's one other thing that I want to mention here that I think is um, extremely interesting. And I don't know if anyone has a good answer to this. It turns out that nature itself likes to put atoms together uh, in crystalline patterns. So an example we heard earlier was minerals. And that's right, minerals do tend to be crystalline. Um, even rocks that don't look very crystalline, they also have small crystalline pieces in them. And nature really prefers to make crystals. And this is kind of a mysterious thing um, because why wouldn't nature just like to take atoms and put them together in some sort of random jumbled way? Um, it's, it, it's kind of a, an amazing thing. I think the mathematical answer is that it sort of puts everything into the lowest energy state, which is where nature likes to put everything. You know, if you put a ball at the top of a hill, it wants to roll to the bottom of the hill. Um, but, but I think it's still uh, kind of incredible. Okay, so these are our pieces of the puzzle. And I wanna give you now um, a really uh, important example that we're all familiar with, and that is the smartphone. So here's a nice graphic that I got online. You can see it's from Compound uh, Chem. Uh, anyways, this is a great website with lots of different infographics like this. And it sort of lays out the different elements that are in a smartphone iPad. And so what I want to ask everyone is which elements here do you recognize? Uh, feel free to name any of them. And I know they have the names on them, but I'm just curious, which ones do you recognize? 
All right, so looking at all these squares, go ahead and type in what you recognize. Um, and and uh, Dr. Ryan, I want you to, to know that you said something very important. And you said that um, salt is important for life. Uh, and the biology part of me remembers that sodium and potassium are very important for uh, life functions. So in a way, you've told us that salt in our French fries is very important. <laughs> yes, it's incredible. That's right. But you know what's especially important about the salt is the iodine that they add to it. Did you know that before iodine started getting added to salt in the US, that um, the average IQ was substantially lower? <laughs> as soon as they started adding it, the people got a lot smarter because it's essential for your biological function. Small I did not know that. Yeah. How about that. Kind of I know that um, they sell low, was it low iodine salt? And that's slightly radioactive. Yeah, so iodine can also be radioactive, but not in a way that's dangerous for no. us, or at least not what you would get at the store. All right, here are the elements that have been listed. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Oof. Oxygen, lithium, carbon, gold, silver, oxygen, indium, cobalt, aluminum, tin, silicon, potassium, arsenic. Um, I think they got them all. That's fantastic. Okay, that's fantastic. <laughs> That's way more than Carlos and I thought we would get. Okay, so let me go back to the periodic table. And again, I'm sorry that everything's covered up now because I wanna point out that these atoms that we just talked about are all over the periodic table, right? Like oxygen is on the right-hand side at the top, carbon's up there too. Uh, lithium, which is in the battery of a phone, is way on the left-hand side at the top. You can't see it there. Uh, copper is in the middle. Um, I don't remember what else was named, but the point is that even from these ones that we all recognize easily, you know, it's all over the periodic table. And the reason for that is that they all do different jobs. They're all for different things in here. And so let's, let's look back on here. So, you know, if we're talking about the screen, I mean, I don't know this off the top of my head, but the screen apparently has oxygen and tin and aluminum and silicon in it, but it also has some funny things in it, uh, like indium. Indium is a, a metal that's right in the middle, but towards the bottom of the periodic table. It's a funny element that you can actually bend uh, just with your hands. If you look at the battery, what have you got? I mean, probably the most important thing is lithium because that's what gets the charge to move around uh, for the battery to work, but it has some other elements in it. If you go over and look at the electronics, there's some things that we've already mentioned like copper and gold, but there's some other things too. And I think I, especially want to emphasize there's things like dy pr tb nd nd gd these are all um rare earths or lanthanides well they're labeled as rare earths here these are the guys at the bottom of the periodic table uh, labeled in green there so those are very important elements and you have them you know right now in your house um <clears throat> and then even the casing is kind of an incredible a combination of you know some elements like carbon, nickel, and then really strange things like bromine and magnesium. You know, magnesium on its own, if you just had a piece of that, you can light that on fire like crazy. And bromine is this uh, liquid that likes to turn into a gas and it's really bad for you. But since it's in the casing, it's in a crystalline structure, it's bonded with those other elements that are around, it's there and it gives that the properties uh, that it needs to have to be strong, you know, and something that you don't uh, easily break. Okay, so- I'm Ryan, hold on, I'm gonna jump in okay. real fast while we're talking about the smartphone. Somebody asked, why do all these elements, why are all these elements in our smartphones? And these are the properties of all these things that allow us to make the smartphones work. Like the glass touchscreen, the indium makes that conductive. Without the indium, the touchscreen won't work. Gold is one of the best conductors on the planet. And besides being rare and precious and beautiful, the electronic um, and thermal properties of gold are super important. So all these elements have these properties that make them unique, but are also very useful to us as a civilization. That's right. And also um, what's really important is that if you tried to make the screen out of indium by itself, that wouldn't work at all. Because it just indium, I don't have a picture of it here, 
but it just looks like a piece of metal. You know, you don't want just a piece of metal for the screen. But when you mix it in just the right way, you know, in the right crystal structure and in the right quantities with tin and oxygen, it becomes this transparent thing that also transmits, you know, the electricity, you know, through the screen so that you can do the touchscreen stuff. And so each one of these components uh, that's in the phone is made of special, you know, combination of elements to make it do something in particular. Um, okay, so I'm almost out of time, but I think that actually this timing is perfect because I wanna give you an example now. We've talked about how it's great to make different things out of different elements and what different elements might be good for. But of course we have to actually make these things. And this is just one of my most favorite things. Um, it's what we do in my lab. And I really feel like, a, like an alchemist or something uh, when we're doing this work. So I wanna show you a video now um, of sort of a rudimentary type of crystal growth um that is very safe um and and it'll give you a nice uh, illustration of of how you can actually accomplish or how we accomplish this uh, on a regular basis and how really anyone can okay so this is a video about crystal growth and i'll i'll narrate it as we go if i can get it to start and let me get it to the right place okay so what this is going to be is a video about um, growing crystals of borax. So who knows what borax is? Does anyone know what borax is? I probably didn't when I was, you know, in middle school or high school. We're going to see if anything gets typed in, but nothing. Oh, I use it for my clothes. It's a laundry yeah, detergent. Yeah, that's right. It's a laundry detergent. Okay. So this is something you can buy at the store. Um, if you do buy it at the store, I have heard of some people having skin sensitivity Sorry, to it. Say that again? No, my phone. <laughs> um, so be careful. You know, if you if you do feel like you want to try this experiment at home, be sure to involve your parents, wear gloves, you know, take care of yourself. But this is something that you can buy at the store. Um, and it is just laundry detergent. I'm right. And I'm going to jump in real fast for the record. Absolutely. This what you're going to show them can be done with salt or sugar, too. Absolutely, that's right. And actually, you may prefer to do it with sugar because then you can have sugar crystals, which is a lot more fun. And then you can eat your experiments. <laughs> yeah. So which you can also do with salt, but it's not as good. Yeah, and it's I found that one to be harder. But anyways, um, so borax is mined out of the ground. It's a uh, mineral um, that I guess I think they mine it in California, but there's probably other places. Anyways, it's just a white powder uh, that you can buy at the store. So here we go. We're going to take some of this borax. And the idea here uh, is that we're going to go ahead and heat up some water. Uh, here we're doing this on a hot plate. I've done it at home with my kids um, on the stove too, just trying not to make a mess because it's kind of maybe it's a little hard to clean up. The other thing that I've got going here, I'm heating up the water and I've got a pencil with a string hanging off of it. And the reason I've got that string there is that when the crystals actually start to form, I want them to maybe prefer to form on that string or to nucleate on the string. Okay, we're nice and warm. So I'm pouring the borax in and you see that it dissolves in. This is just like when you put sugar in water, right? You can dissolve sugar into water or salt into water. And you can do that over and over and over again. And it's not that the borax is disappearing, it's just going into the liquid, right? So we're gonna do this. Well, actually we did it some more times. And what we're trying to do is to super saturate that water uh, with borax. You can get more borax uh, into water when it's hot, right? Um, the hotter a liquid is, the more of whatever you're dissolving into it uh, that you can get into it. Okay, so we go on with this for some time. Um, you can see we can really get a lot of borax in there. Remember that each time I was basically filling up that smaller beaker uh, with borax. But we are getting to a point now where it gets harder and harder to get more in. Okay, so now it's super saturated. The water's hot. And what we're going to do is turn off the heat now and let the solution start to cool down. And for a long time, see, we're already at an hour, nothing's happening. But if we're patient and take the timer away, although I assure you this wasn't more than two hours, <laughs> Um, we'll start to see something happening in just a minute. 
And remember that the water is cooling down. So now you see at the top of the um, beaker, um, there we go, it's come back around. We have crystals forming and at the bottom and off of the string. And what's happening is that the uh, borax that was dissolved into the water is now precipitating out of it because the water is cooling down and it can no longer hold as much of that borax material. And as this happens, the borax, this is actually a molecule, the borax molecules start lining up uh, in a crystalline fashion uh, to form these large uh, crystals that we see here. Now, I will say that we're making lots of crystals and some of them are pretty nice crystals, but actually what's happening is that you'll sort of start to see that the crystal will nucleate and then another one will start next to it and another one will start next to it and another one will start next to it. Ultimately, when you have these combinations of crystals that are sort of forming all over and randomly oriented with respect to each other, what you would call that is a polycrystal. And a lot of times in the lab, what we prefer to have are examples where they line up perfectly and they line up perfectly over really large scales um, and those are called single crystals, right? But in any case, you get the idea. One way to grow um, crystalline materials is to dissolve <clears throat> what you want to grow into a solvent. Sometimes it involves heating the solvent, sometimes not. And then you cool that solvent down. That drives the crystals out of um, the solution, and then they self-assemble themselves. So it's a pretty fun experiment to do. So that brings us to the end of that video. And I'll just pause for a minute if there's any questions about this. One question just came in. Are scientists able to make diamonds this way? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So um, in, order, in order for this method of crystal growth to work, you need to be able to dissolve the atoms of the thing that you want to grow um, into a solution. And as it turns out, okay, diamonds are made out of carbon. And carbon is one of these elements that is extremely resistant to being dissolved into other things. So the answer is actually no. Um, the way that we know how to make um, diamonds uh, involves taking carbon and compressing it really hard. Because the other thing about carbon is that it really doesn't want to share electrons with other atoms, much less itself. So you got to push on it really hard, and then you have to heat it to very high temperatures. And that's what happens in nature, right, when, when diamonds form. And we can also do that in the laboratory. Um, so unfortunately, this is not a good way to make diamonds. You can make other things. <laughs> OK. Do we have another question? I think that's it. They wanted to know how you clean this up afterwards, and that's just lots of water. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's a, a um, misconception about the heat making the borax dissolve, but I clarified that the heat helps it dissolve, but that's not the sole reason why it's dissolving. Okay, thank you. So I think that you are, oh, wait, wait, one more thing. You can use borax as insect repellent. It, that you can. So let me do. let me do one more thing. If everyone will hang in with me for just one more minute, I know I've totally run over the time. I just want to say that this example of dissolving uh, things into water is something you can do at home. But what we actually do in the laboratory is we use other things that we can melt at much higher temperatures. Um, for example, these uh, metal indium shown on the left hand side, and then we can dissolve other things into that, and that's more generally speaking, uh, how we go about producing crystals uh, using this uh, solvent method. So with that, I'm at the end of my time. I really appreciate everyone listening and all the awesome questions that you had. And um, I'll go ahead and go on to the next slide and turn it back over to Yulia. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for all of this. Um, that was amazing, and I can only uh, guess from the many questions and the huge participation here that um, everybody's really been enjoying this and, and was captured by that awesome science. Um, I'd like to advertise for the March Science Night. So um, we hope to see you all when we talk about ancient climate change with Dr. Jeremy. And um, also I'd like to um, thank you all for coming in. It's uh, been absolutely amazing having you all. 
Um, really uh, appreciative of you all coming. Uh, Ryan for his talk, uh, Carlos as the chat master. Um, looking forward to see you next month. And with this, I pass to Stephanie for the library picks. Yeah, I just wanted to hop in really quick. Um, if any of you are interested in, which it seemed like all of you were really excited about uh, Dr. Ryan's talk, um, we have some books at the library that you can place on hold. Um, and I've put together a list for you. Um, if you click that link right there, it'll take you to a page of different books that you can put on hold and check out and learn more about this stuff. Um, each one, and there's like links inside of it, so you can just click on it. It takes you right to the library's catalog. So if you wanted to check that out, please do. And we also added all of Stephanie's book uh, picks to our Pinterest page. So if you go to the MagLab Pinterest page, Books and Science, there is a uh, special folder for tonight's Science Night, and all those books are also placed on there, as well as for all the other Science Nights that you can also watch on our YouTube channel. So uh, have fun with that. And with that, I pass to Carlos for closing out the event. Great questions tonight, as always. Lots of challenging ones. Ryan did an awesome job answering all the questions. And remember, science says that salt on your fries is good for you. Um, I just put the link in for the MagLab summer camps. We've got our middle school camps in July this year. One week for Camp Tesla, one week for Psy Girls. It'll be exciting to have everyone back in the building. That is the plan right now. Um, and with that, thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like to finish by saying that the National Mag Lab is a taxpayer, is taxpayer funded by the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida. If that makes all of you supporters of our facility and we appreciate you all for that. And finally, stay nerdy, stay geeky and stay true to who you are. And remember that science is an activity for everyone. So on behalf of Blaster and Soundwave, I say good night to everyone and we'll see you all soon. <laughs>that are lined up to do it, but it was fun. I'd do it again. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, All you right. know, hopefully next season we're out there in person. Um, oh, yeah. I can't oh, wait yeah. to get back to the library with buckets full of handful, hands, uh, hands on toys. Oh, and yeah. um, I'm excited too. Yeah. Have some Julia, how, how many Transformers can I bring with me in person? Because this is going to be an issue. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on how big a bucket you can carry. <laughs> disappointed if you don't bring some, I think, at this point. <laughs> I think I have to. <laughs> all right, guys. See you all. Thanks Thanks so much. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. That was Stephanie, great. We'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.